you know, you talked about uh, private sector dynamism and uh, the public sector stepping into de-risk, and that's essentially what we are seeing happen at this point in time. Not so much dynamism on the private sector part in the context of what we are seeing with the financial sector uh, meltdown, uh, uh, albeit not a contagion just yet, and of course the public sector stepping in to prevent a contagion. Uh, what do you make of what we're seeing happen? Uh, once again, revisiting uh, to some extent the kinds of uh, issues that we saw play out through the 2008 financial crisis and the implications of this on some of the development agenda goals? Well, the implications of this global economic situation on the development agenda is actually quite disturbing. The reality is over 20 plus years, we had a lot of convergence in human development. Countries uh, that were lower income grew much faster than countries that were higher income. That growth helped lift people out of poverty and lift up their living conditions and their standards. And we saw real convergence and achievement of progress against the Sustainable Development Goals. COVID has devastated that. And during COVID, wealthy countries spent 30% of their GDP shoring up their economies. Emerging economies spent 6% and less developed countries spent only 2%. And as a result of that, we're seeing real divergence now in terms of human development outcomes. More people are energy poor versus less. More people are hungry because of a global food crisis, in part caused by the crisis and, and conflict between Russia and Ukraine. Fewer people have access to the health care they need in order to achieve the maternal and child health goals, which India has so uh, you know, strongly committed to and has led international efforts on. So in order to turn that around, we really do need to understand that to meet the moment we're in from a moral basis, from a global security basis, and from the basis of creating inclusive economic growth everywhere, we need to do things very, very differently. And that's why the Rockefeller Foundation has advanced a strong agenda for the G20 and is partnering with the G20. And frankly, it's why I'm hopeful that Prime Minister Modi, with his uh, strength uh, as a political leader and with India's example, as a rapidly growing country embracing renewable electrification at the scale it is, can actually use this G20 to change the course of development and climate history. You know, uh, Rajiv, uh, you, you are hopeful that there could be a change in course, but what is the best outcome that you would hope for uh, from, of course, the, the meeting here in India in September when the G20 leaders meet, but also in Paris, uh, uh, where India is, of course, also going to be hosting uh, the meeting as far as international finance institutions are concerned. What is the best outcome that you hope for? Well, all of these processes will help build the political consensus around transforming the global financial system as it relates to climate and development finance. And I hope for a few big outcomes. First, I want everyone to see that the only way to protect the planet from, the, from catastrophic climate change is to invest in resilient infrastructure that helps people live better lives in developing and emerging economies. That's an observation that India understands and India is a great example of. That's not a concept that every G7 nation fully appreciates. Uh, too many people think of climate and development as different things, and too many people don't uh, see just how much large-scale, long-term investment is required to solve both challenges together. Second, I think the G20 can actually implement some of the reforms we've been talking about. For example, India's already set the goal of uh, bringing 25 gigawatts of solar power into its agriculture sector and, doing, and focusing on improving farmers' incomes and livelihoods in doing so. We could partner with the Global Energy Alliance for People and Planet, public and private, to put in place uh, model programs that are exactly what should be happening on, larger, on a larger global scale, where you use private money from places like the Rockefeller Foundation to de-risk commercial investment in these types of efforts and greatly expand performance against those targets and objectives. And I think it's very important that the G20 not just be a place where there's a lot of talk, but also a place where there's a lot of action. And the Rockefeller Foundation has been able to support action in India for more than 100 years, and we hope to continue that trend.
Well, that certainly is the hope that we will see more action. But, uh, you know, speaking about some of the risks, and we spoke about this when we uh, met earlier this year in Davos. Uh, since then, we've, of course, seen energy prices coming off even more sharply, specifically in the last fortnight. There continues to be uncertainty on uh, the Russia-Ukraine war. President Xi uh, meeting with uh, uh, President Putin. Uh, we don't know whether this is going to lead to any kind of a breakthrough yet. But uh, how would you assess risks at this point in time, especially in the context of the war and its impact on both energy as well as food security? Well, I think both the war and a number of other uh, global trends uh, are resulting in the reality that interest rates uh, across the board, fuel prices across the board, and food prices across the board will remain elevated for a significant period of time looking forward than they have been when you look over a longer period of time backwards at what the average prices have been. There'll be fluctuations, of course, that are very short term. But in general, we should be planning for a higher food price situation, a higher fuel price situation, and higher interest rate situation looking to the future. And what that means is not just sort of a small discomfort in the living standards of people who live in wealthier nations. It means we have to fundamentally rethink how we make capital available, public and private, in developing and emerging economies so that we can make the kinds of investments that GAP and other partners here in India are making to, to ensure that the future actually yields more opportunity for people who've previously been left behind. Uh, you know, Rajiv, before I let you go, uh, uh, you're here in India assessing the impact of the work that's already been done by the Rockefeller Foundation in partnership with uh, Indian companies like Tata Power, etc. If I were to ask you to map out for me uh, the next big milestones that you hope to achieve here, uh, you know, what would those be? Well, I'll just give you three to make it easy. The first is, uh, is in energy. I think we're going to continue to expand partnerships, not just on rural mini-grids, but on grid-based storage uh, and battery storage for, for the grid to demonstrate that the grid can take on more renewables. On productive use examples like solarizing agriculture and agricultural value chains across the country to improve food, nutrition, and income outcomes for farmers and rural communities. Uh, and so many other examples. So, so unlocking entrepreneurship through renewable electrification will be a big focus going forward. Second, we've continued to invest in health and food as we have for decades. Uh, most recently during COVID, we worked a lot on the rapid testing. We worked on making vaccines accessible in, in communities across the country. We continue that effort because India has such an opportunity to be one of the first countries to at scale achieve the Sustainable Development Goals in Child and Maternal Mortality, so we're very focused on that. And third, we continue to work together on thinking about climate adaptation, climate modeling. A large part of my trip is visiting with communities that will be made more vulnerable uh, from climate changes, whether they're farmers who will struggle to grow their crops or salt pan workers who uh, otherwise uh, suffer when there's extreme heat. And understanding that climate changes will affect the most vulnerable people and putting in place the science and the partnerships to help preclude and prevent that uh, deleterious change will be another priority for us as we look to the future. You know, Rajiv, on the uh, climate adaptation side, you spoke specifically about agriculture as well and food. Uh, are you looking at the startup ecosystem in India? Because there are a lot of companies that are working on uh, providing innovative solutions within the agri-tech space. Uh, uh, you know, is that an area of interest uh, and opportunity for you? Well, it absolutely is. In, in fact, we've already invested in agricultural technology and alternative proteins in, uh, in different kinds of production systems, in heat tolerant, heat sensitive uh, crop development, Indian agricultural scientists uh, working often at institutes that Rockefeller has been involved with for decades, continue to work on those important priorities. In addition to that, we've been very focused on helping to develop more regenerative agricultural systems. The reality is the future of agriculture needs to include more regenerative uh, production. That means production that helps make soils richer as opposed to depleting those soils. 
It means production that better uses the natural resources, especially water, that is available. And it means production that's often more focused on high-value uh, crops that can help improve the nutrition outcomes of local populations, uh, as we're doing with certain partners you know, in and around Delhi, uh, where we are right now. So that remains a priority for us. Well, Rajiv, it's uh, been an absolute pleasure. It's always good talking to you. Thanks very much for joining us here on the Global Dialogue uh, uh, to take us through what you've got planned here on this trip in India specifically, but more importantly, uh, the milestones that you hope to mark uh, in your journey here. Always a pleasure. Thanks very much for joining us. We will take a break here on the Global Dialogue, but the news continues here on CNBC TV 18. Don't go anywhere. We're back in a minute with a lot more.